Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the Master of Architecture Open House. I am Mario Gooden, uh, director of the Master of Architecture program, um, and I'm really excited to welcome you this fall to our, to our open house. Um, uh, I don't want to repeat too much of what the, the dean said that you perhaps already heard um, at lunchtime, but just to say um, in particular relative to the Master of Architecture program, um, of course our planet is going through enormous environmental, social, political, and technological changes, and these manifest across a number of different scales, and we like to say that we work transscalarly. Um, uh, across scales in terms of the ways in which bodies, space, ecologies, politics, and aesthetics intersect and are entangled. Um, these intersections are, are the terrain of the disciplines at, at the school, and particularly the, the Master of Architecture um, program, and it's why what we do here is so important, um, and I would say now perhaps uh, more important than ever as we face a, a fierce urgency of now, to, um, to use the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and um, while we certainly work within the discipline, it's also our ethos within the Master of Architecture program to, to question the discipline, um, question uh, the discipline's entanglements with regimes of power, to, to question the entanglements uh, with modernity, the intersections of modernity and coloniality. And I think that is perhaps, you know, <clears throat> uh, confrontationally, if you will, apparent just trying to get onto the campus um, through the gates at 116th Street, walking up the steps past the alma mater, which now has barricades around it. Um, we can see how this place, you know, this campus, this school, um, and the, the, the discipline, if you will, are, uh, I would say, accomplices um, to the issues that we are facing, uh, facing right now. Um, but again, what we do here is extremely important, and it's not simply in terms of critiquing, but designing strategies to confront these issues. Um, and those strategies are, you know, how do we confront uh, inequities, uh, spatial injustice, how do we confront uh, the legacies or the afterlives, if you will, of uh, colonialism um, within the built environment. Um, and so, you know, we are here in Avery Hall. You walk through those gates, you walk through, you walked up the steps, you walked into this building, you know, which is designed by McKim Meaden White in the um, 1880s. Um, you are now in, in here. But we like to think that what we do um, in this space um, is not about conforming, if you will, but we're in a space in which um, we construct a heterogeneous environment for confronting these issues, for radical experimentation. Again, not simply for the sake of critique or experimentation, but how do we situate that within practice, if you will, and how do we go out and, uh, and affect change? How do we affect change politically, socially, um, and through technology? Um, I just want to reinforce, um, you saw this in the Dean's presentation, this is Avery Library, which sits, well, I was going to say below us, but it's sort of there and, uh, and there, um, which is, I would say, something of the, the foundation uh, for the school. Um, it is an archive, but it's a living archive. Um, it is not simply an archive as a repository of, of, of history, but a repository in which we can question history, which we can uh, rethink history, in which we can um, add to that history. Um, and I would encourage you, um, for those of you who will enroll here, that that should become one of your favorite spaces in the building. Um, uh, it was mine when I was a student here some 30 plus years ago, um, and I know for a number of other faculty who were students here, um, here as well. Um, and as you can see, and as you saw in the, in the Dean's presentation, you were perhaps wondering um, how all of these spaces uh, connect. This is Avery. Um, you see we're in Wood Auditorium, um, snaking through and then uh, up the stairs. Um, is fair weather and uh, the maker space in the basement of Skirmerhorn. Um, not only do we think about architecture conceptually, but if architecture is the, is the materialization of concept, then materiality, the materialization of that concept is equally important. How we make, how we construct space, the 
uh, material condition of, of spatial relationships, the material conditions, if you will, of politics, the material conditions of, of uh, spatial justice, the material conditions that affect the environment. And so, um, I hadn't heard the dean say that before, but he said, you know, for some of you, this may not be the right place. <laughs> um, and, you know, that is because um, we do not pretend or, to, or presume to know what architecture is. It's not a, it's not a given, um, it's not a preconceived condition, there's no recipe. Um, the faculty, we the faculty, and the, the MARC faculty, you know, are actually working together with you, and I would say, uh, for most of us, you know, we enjoy teaching because we are actually learning together with you as well. This is a process of constructing new knowledge, not simply regurgitating um, what we already uh, what we already know. And so we framed the Masters of Architecture program around an idea of a radical pedagogy of uncertainty. Um, as we deal with these uncertain times, um, uncertain times which will continue to be uncertain, um, how do we practice? How do we situate ourselves within the world? How do we affect change? How, do, how does architecture intervene uh, politically, socially, and culturally? Um, hence, in order to resituate the discipline of architecture, um, what are design strategies, if you will, for deploying embodied knowledge, for confronting extractivism and capital accumulation, constructing mutualism within interspecies ecologies, and modeling spatial reparations? And so, again, that occurs across scale, um, you know, from the uh, scale of the detail to the scale of territories. Um, and this is uh, work from Professor uh, Maria Lizarraga's uh, studio from fall of uh, 23. Um, it's also about uh, architecture being a part of an ecosystem, being a part of, of an ecology. So architecture is not simply about the object or the aesthetics of making an object, but it is linked within a, a system, a system of material, uh, material construction, uh, uh, systems of labor, uh, systems of power. And then with technological acceleration, how does architecture confront that when things are happening so, uh, so quickly in terms of uh, technology, not only in terms of, uh, of how we design or how we make, but how we uh, confront uh, our daily lives. And then, uh, of course, thinking about the environment and climate change. Um, and the need that perhaps um, it is not simply about building, but it could be about reconstructing. It could also be um, about reuse. And how do we think about the material conditions of that? How do we think about uh, carbon neutral materials? How do we think about carbon re uh, reductive architecture, if you will? And then, of course, that uh, space is not abstract. Um, it relates to, uh, or it relates us to each other um, in terms of those relationships. So in terms of the legacies of colonialism, of, uh, of chattel slavery, this is race and modern architecture, which came out, I think, in 2020 or 2021, um, which was co-edited by Professor Mabel Wilson, who's part of our faculty here, um, uh, along with uh, uh, Charles Davis and, uh, and Renee Ching. And so, you know, as we think about the, the MARC program, you know, we are, again, working across scales, but working across scales to think about how all of these, uh, uh, these issues are, are related. So just to uh, go through and sort of talk about the organization of the program, um, talk about um, uh, the curriculum, um, you see that our curriculum, let's say, is organized according to these sequences the design uh, studio sequence, uh, the technology sequence, the representation sequence, and you'll hear from uh, those faculty um, during the Q&A period, um, our hi history theory sequence, um, our professional practice sequence, and then a whole host of, of electives. Um, our uh, semester, our three-year programs are, of course, broken into semesters. The first three semesters have been what we um, had been calling the core, we simply call them semester one, two, and three now. Um, but the first three semesters are 
situated around the ideas of questions of architecture. Um, yes, in the first, first year, first semester, um, we will be, of course, um, teaching the fundamentals, but we don't think that it's too, uh, uh, too difficult to question the fundamentals while also teaching the fundamentals. So we can ask very, very high order questions, not just wait until we get to the second or third year, but actually begin to ask questions of how do we confront um, environmental degradation? How do we confront uh, the intersections of coloniality and modernity, even in the first three, uh, first three semesters? And then the second three semesters, practicing uncertainty. Now architecture is situated practice. Um, what does it mean to practice? And yes, this is a professional program, but we are not simply speaking about uh, the professional aspects of architectural practice, but what does it mean to practice architecture, let's say, as life work, as a mode of being in the world and as a mode of creating and affecting, uh, affecting change. And so just to get a little bit more specific, uh, so the uh, very uh, first studio, uh, first semester, first year, uh, questions of architecture um, uh, is the sort of broad, if you will, umbrella for that studio. Um, currently, uh, with the kind of subtopic, if you will, of fugitive mobilities, um, which you know, our key words, if you will, are embodiment, ecology, environment, uh, care, equity, reparations, and then we think about those through scale, through materiality, uh, through space, through structure, through detail, and through relation. Um, that, and I would say this semester, we are also uh, really thinking about uh, the environment and ecology, and uh, I would say the, the relationships between um, uh, technology, if you will, in terms of environment and also uh, architectural design in terms of, uh, in terms of environment. And so you, and that uh, AT, which is architectural technology one, that is environments and architecture, um, architectural drawing and representation, uh, ADR one, which is the first required course of our representation sequence. And I'll say a little bit more about that um, uh, in a few minutes. And then history theory, uh, questions of architecture, first semester, and then the second semester, questions of architecture too. And you see that, if you will, sort of loops back into the studio in terms of questions of architecture. How do we think about questions of architecture historically um, and resituate um, the way in which we approach architectural history such that, um, and Professor Reinhold Martin may say a little bit more about this later, you know, uh, when I was in school, there was the big survey class that went from antiquity to about 1945. That is not the way that we teach architectural history here at, at, uh, at GSEP, right, and in the MR program. Uh, in the second, uh, second semester, uh, Studio 2, and I should say in both of these semesters, you see that there are actually eight sections um, in the uh, first year studios. Here we begin to think about architecture really as a mode of knowledge construction. Um, through, uh, through research and what does it mean to think about architecture through, uh, through research in a studio called damage control. Then structures in architecture, uh, architectural representation two, uh, questions of architecture or questions of uh, architectural history two, and in the third semester, uh, which is uh, the studio in which we uh, investigate, let's say, dwelling, if you will, or, or settlement, this is the housing studio. Uh, thinking about architecture now as situated practice, we work on sites in New York City this semester. Um, and after uh, this presentation today, you'll go uh, around the building and uh, we're actually having mid-reviews for Studio 3 um, and you'll get to see some of the work that's uh, going on uh, in those studios. Um, architectural technology, three materials and assemblies. Um, so thinking about Again, the materialization of concept, if you will, structure and enclosure, and building systems and integration. And here I would also add that we not, again, we're not simply thinking about the architecture as, as an object, but we're also thinking about 
the material sources. Where do those sources come from? Um, what is the labor that's involved in terms of, uh, in terms of assemblies? And then we have our history theory uh, distribution requirements. In the fourth semester, uh, the studio is framed as uh, territoriality, contested territories. So we're working at a larger scale, uh, a regional scale um, within the uh, mid-Atlantic New England area, uh, mostly around uh, upstate uh, New York, but also um, uh, in the Delaware Valley and uh, out on Long Island. Um, again, our keywords, if you will, ecology, environment, uh, carbonization, extraction, equity, reparation. Thinking those through in terms of transcalarity, uh, materiality, space, structure, detail, and relations. Uh, construction and life cycle uh, of buildings, uh, our representation electives, history theory uh, distribution requirements, uh, now in the fifth, uh, fifth semester and sixth semester, um, and I should say all three semesters are under, if you will, the kind of idea of practicing uncertainty. Um, you'll see that we've gone from eight studios now to, if you count all of those, over about 18 uh, studios um, in which we have uh, an, a vast ecosystem, if you will, of diverse uh, of diverse studios. Um, in the fall, um, our, we have uh, around, let's say, a quarter or so of those studios um, being taught by international visiting critics. In the spring semester, um, those studios all, will all travel. But we have our tech electives in this semester, our history theory distribution requirements again, and our required uh, professional practice course. Um, we also have professional practice uh, electives that we will have in the uh, in the sixth semester, and then in uh, the sixth semester, again in both of these semesters, uh, five and six, we're thinking about the entanglements of architecture um, and uh, intersectionality and practice. Again, what does it mean to practice uncertainty? What does it mean to practice uh, architecture in, uh, in uncertain times? And so if you go to the GSAP website, um, some of you, I'm sure you've already sort of seen this, you'll see it, how all of these sort of work out in terms of the graduation requirements and the credits that you will take um, for, each, uh, for each semester. And so very uh, quickly, I'll talk about the design studios, um, beginning with uh, Studio One, which is coordinated by Maria Lizarraga and Maria, I'm probably gonna say some stuff and not get it quite right, so just like tell me if I, if I don't. Um, but if you go upstairs on the 400 level, you'll see an exhibition of, of drawings from this semester that were just completed a couple of weeks ago um, called Metabolic Section Drawings. Um, the studio is called Fugitive Mobilities, The Politics of Mixture. And I'll go through these very, uh, very quickly, starting with the scale of, of the body uh, and thinking about the body in terms of, uh, in terms of environment in terms of, uh, I won't necessarily say thermal comfort, but perhaps how do we can confront the environment in terms of issues of, uh, of uh, thermal comfort and what have you. And that is sort of, of course, situated within the, uh, uh, within the conversation around climate change. Uh, climate change, uh, extreme weather events, climate action failure, um, you sort of see these top 10 risks, if you will. Um, we also think about that relative to you know, ecological systems, so sun, wind, water, soil. Um, then uh, this is the kind of transcalar relationship, if you will, looking at systems, geopolitics, uh, and, uh, and inequality, technology, uh, growth. Um, and I think I might have pressed the button too quickly. Um, in terms of interspecies relationships, so placing the human not above all of these, but as one of these in relationship um, to these conditions. So uh, we always come from another form. We are its deformation, its variation, its anamorphosis. So again, embodiment, ecology, environment, care, equity, reparation, scale, 
materiality, space, structure, detail, and relations, transformation. So, uh, you know, the first assignment dealt with the body. The second assignment I mentioned, the metabolic sectional drawings um, that you'll see on the fourth floor. Um, and the metabolic sections, I'll say a bit more about those uh, in a second. Uh, Studio One has their mid-reviews starting on Wednesday, on Wednesday um, uh, and that will be with exercise three, which is the, the garden exercise, and then the final exercise of the semester will be to construct a space of assembly, but thinking about architectural, architecture as infrastructure. And I'll go, go through these very sort of quickly in terms of some eye candy and thinking historically about architecture and, and the body. Uh, these were, uh, if you will, sort of prompts in the reference bank for the first assignment. The metabolic section really sort of situates architecture within a kind of system going from, and I'll use the example that I've heard Maria talk about for a couple of times now, you know, the sweater in the washing machine, thinking about the fibers then which become part of the, uh, the waste stream, the domestic waste stream through the sanitary sewer. Those fibers end up in, uh, uh, you know, eventually will sort of make its way and end up perhaps in the ocean, and then how that encounter happens with let's say uh, a whale or, or, or a species or uh, ocean life species. I can go ahead, okay, very quickly. <laughs> but you can see the exuberance in terms of, you know, the stimulation in terms of thinking about architecture in terms of its relationships with all of these sort of matters. Um, and as I said, the final assignment will be one on uh, situating architecture as infrastructure and thinking about climate. These are just some photographs from the very first exercise. This was the material picnic that happened just out here where students, uh, you know, in an afternoon began to kind of confront the questions of architecture's engagement with its environment through the construction of, uh, of these uh, body architectures, if you will. And then some examples of the metabolic sections No. And again, this is all first semester. I mean, fantastic drawings, by the way. And you'll see these again on the fourth floor. Then Studio 3, the housing uh, studio. Um, housing has a long history at Columbia. We're coming up on the 50th uh, year of the housing studio, um, which will be next, next year. They are also working, uh, again, working uh, on a site in West Harlem. Uh, their mid-reviews, as I said, are going on now. Um, uh, this is just to give you some context. And uh, this studio begins, uh, also it brings in, I should say, uh, experts who work with uh, NYCHA, which is the New York City um, Housing uh, Authority, um, local uh, activists, um, community groups, and these are some examples from, uh, from fall of 23, from last fall. And so in the housing studio, um, you know, as you're seeing from these examples, this is not typologically based, um, but we're really thinking about what does it mean to, to live together? How do we think about collective? Uh, living in terms of collectives, how do we resituate what we used to think of as sort of social housing, if you will, um, now in terms of these issues that we're confronting, climate change, environmental degradation, spatial injustice, uh, and reparations. So here's an example of a, of a project which actually, you know, I would say atomizes the notion of, of type into a kind of reconfigurable collective idea about space making and, uh, and living. And then Advanced Studio 5 um, on the sixth floor, uh, Avery 600 in the north and south studios. You may see some, uh, some work from our mid-reviews which were held uh, last week. Uh, the studios are, called, are under the, let's say, uh, umbrella of practicing uncertainty, but we're sort of putting a spin on that, thinking about possibilism. 
So what is possible? How do we think about um, the agency, if you will, of architecture and of architects um, while practicing uncertainty? And as I mentioned, there are 18 studios. This gives you some, some sense of the studio topics this semester. You know, everything from, uh, the dean mentioned the, uh, the Well School, which is the clinic that Brian E. Roberts is, uh, is teaching, to uh, the homing studio, which is being led by A.L. Hugh, to uh, David Benjamin's carbon removal architecture. Uh, so again, quite a bit of diversity amongst these, uh, amongst the studios um, that you are able to, let's say, chart your path you know, uh, in the, during your third year. And some examples from the mid-reviews last week, these are from uh, examples from Emmanuel and Matthew's After Property uh, Studio, uh, which is based in Harlem. And the studio that I am co-teaching with uh, uh, Dene Navajo composer uh, Raven Chacon called Settlement. And the history theory uh, sequence. Um, I think I have all of our core faculty. I left out one before <laughs> Rhino. Um, but we have, I would say, and Rhino would probably say this as well, um, I, I think the most stellar group of core history theory faculty anywhere. Um, so Professor Reinhold Martin uh, coordinates that sequence. Um, I mentioned Professor Mabel Wilson. Uh, Professor Lucia L.A. is the director of the Buell Center. Uh, Felicity Scott, Mark Wigley, Atia Perkawala, um, and Professor Mary McLeod, who was my teacher when I was a student here as well. The technology sequence, um, it's the interim coordinators are Professor Lori Hugginson and Michael Bell. Um, Lori is here, and you'll hear from Lori um, during the Q&A. Um, I've mentioned this when we looked at the, uh, the sequence chart, um, but we also have a number of, of uh, tech electives. These are the electives that we are offering this fall. Um, environments and architecture, I'm just gonna go through these very, very quickly. This just kind of gives you a sense of, of the student work and the questions that we're asking uh, in the tech sequence. Uh, representation. <clears throat> About uh, a year and a half ago, we decoupled computation and, rep and, rep and representation uh, uh, within the what we used to call the visual studies. Um, as you know, we have the computational design practices uh, program, and as the dean mentioned, we have <clears throat> what we call the computation uh, computation glue, such that computation goes across all of the programs uh, at uh, at GSAP. And the representation uh, sequence, um, we wanted to reframe how we think about architectural representation. Um, architecture as a discipline, of course, emerges you know, simultaneously to European colonization. And I would say that architectural representation traditionally has been predicated on this notion of an ideal subject. Um, the uh, uh, Perugino's Christ delivering the keys is the prime example of you know, the one-point perspective for those of you who maybe know how to plot a one-point perspective, but that was from this, uh, from the eye or from the point of view of an ideal subject who is able to uh, organize, to mathematically and, and geometrically organize the world, if you will, uh, the built environment and nature, and somehow have power over it. One, the notion of a universal subject has never been universal and never ideal. So we wanted to really open up this notion of, of representation to think about other modes of architectural representation in terms of, I should say, other modes of representing space and relationships. So this just gives you some examples. Um, this is the uh, ADR1 and ADR2, the two required courses. Um, I mentioned the computational glue, but we also have what we call the GSAP smorgasbord, which has resources for students and, and faculty. And uh, although there are two required courses, ADR1 and ADR2, there are, again, a host of 
representation and computation elective uh, that you can take during your time here. And I'll go through these very quickly, but this gives you a sense of, you know, of the, uh, the subjects and, uh, and ideas that are covered in, in our representation uh, required courses. And this was the first week, is that right? So day one, the student uh, went out you know, and used, you know, Avery used Fairweather, used our campus to make these imprints you know, uh, as a way of, let's say, of measuring and understanding scale representation of buildings and also using the sun to make these, uh, to make these prints. And perhaps Amarin might say a, a bit more about that during the Q&A. Um, and, uh, you know, so architectural representation, including tools of plaster, stenciling, playable, time-based, research and curatorial. Um, and we see this as kind of filling out eventually in terms of all the ways of thinking about architectural representation and, and the kinds of electives that we can offer you here. And just this past weekend, um, we had our inaugural drawing project, um, which was a one-day event um, where we had uh, three of our faculty and one of our recent grads from 2022 come back to present their work, to present uh, architectural drawing, and, uh, and to talk about sort of drawing as, as research, drawing as practice. Um, and then in the afternoon, we had sessions where our uh, associate faculty had one-on-one -on -one uh, tutorials, if you will, with our first and second year students. And uh, this was our inaugural drawing project. It will become an annual uh, event that will happen every, every fall. And then our professional practice course, um, the required course, um, which is taught by uh, Alessandro Orsini, and you'll hear from Alessandro. Um, and we actually have two uh, professional practice electives, one taught by um, uh, Robert Herman, and the other taught by Professor Juan Herreros. And so, um, all of this is on our website um, at arc.columbia.edu, um, including our end of the year show, which is a kind of archive, if you will, of, uh, of work across the, from all of the programs, the MARC program, as well, you click on any of these and it will open up the, the studios for that, for that year and you can see examples of student works. And we also uh, host uh, the portfolios of graduating students. One of the requirements for graduation at the end of your six semesters will be to submit a portfolio um, that happens about three or four days before graduation and then all of the faculty get together uh, and review the portfolio. Um, one, it is to, to take, a, let's say, a temperature of what's going on uh, in the program and at the school. And two, it is also um, how we determine the awards for that year. Um, but again, all of this is, uh, is, at, uh, is at the CSAC website. So hopefully, uh, I think we good. We're, we have enough time here for uh, some questions uh, and to answer any questions that you have. So I want to invite Professor Amarinaya to come up and Maria uh, Lizarraga, uh, Reinhold Martin, Alessandra Orsini, and uh, Laurie Hawkins. And Galia Solomonoff. Hi, Galia. So Amarinaya is the uh, coordinator of our representation system. Maria Lizarraga uh, is the coordinator of Studio One, uh, first year studio. Uh, Professor Reinhold Martin is the coordinator of the history theory unit. Professor Valerie Salmanoff is a professor of practice and director of the housing lab. And Alexander Orsini uh, teaches our professional practice course and also teaches uh, Studio Four in the, in the spring. So uh, now it's your time to speak. <laughs> Any questions? And let me introduce some of you, uh, most of you probably met them this morning when you checked in, uh, Darwin and who is the assistant.
assistant director for the master of architecture program. Um, when you arrived here uh, the fall of 2018, we were just in 2025. You'll get to know Darwin very, very well. Um, I was wondering, uh, GSAP seems very robust and very self-contained, but I was wondering if there's any kind of degree of porosity between GSAP and maybe the larger university itself, especially across other uh, gra graduate schools within the university. Yes. 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 Yeah, well, I know I can, it depends on what you have in mind. Yeah, hi, Ryan Horner. Um, what do you what do you have in mind? Is there something specific or or? Well, I guess in the sense of um, architecture being relatively interdisciplinary by nature, yeah, and the university being so multifaceted, I imagine there's right. realm for scholarship to have this kind of cross pollination or yeah. entering the realms that there may be expertise in other parts of the school beyond just GSEP itself. So I was just wondering if that yeah. Arises. No, I mean, first, yeah, sort of, first of all, by the way, those diagrams and everything, we're still trying to figure them out, but I think it's pretty straightforward that, that, that you, you have a couple of electives in whatever, this third year mostly, right? Where, where students can just fulfill those electives, those three electives in various ways. So people do take classes across. Um, but the bigger question that you're asking about the relationship of, I guess, of, of a professional school like this, and of course this is the professional program, the MRC program, in relationship to others, um, you know, could be broken down. I'm, I'm actually teaching a course next semester on the history of the Columbia campus for reasons that you might infer, um, that uh, is university-wide and uh, also undergraduate and and, and one of the things that we're emphasizing is that there are many, a place like this is a very large and complex institution, and, and also we're emphasizing the more recent history. Um, there are many Colombians. Uh, the one you've been reading about is one of them, the one in the news, like in the front page news. And that's one of them, and this institution is part of that, but not, has been a little bit off to the side in, in most of the drama. Um, and partly because we're a professional school. And if you kind of think about the campus, this, this upper part of the campus, you could just go out the door here at Avery and you'll see um, that what used to be the business school, that has moved to Manhattanville in an architecturally ambitious building. Um, and uh, the law school is like across the way. Uh, the journalism school, which is one place you might look because they do do cultural journalism and deal with, we do, we've done over the years events and things with them, uh, is in the corner near um, the lawn. And SIPA, the International Affairs, where Professor Clinton teaches, is in, in the other across Amsterdam. So each one of those are professional schools. They all have these, not all of them are accredited in the way that you see the subtext of Mario is telling you, this is an accredited program. And, and you, there are, believe it or not, somewhere in there, you're actually gonna learn things that are gonna make sure that the buildings don't fall down and, and that people can breathe the air. And, and, and most of all, that, that you will not put as much carbon into the atmosphere as is currently being spewed because that's, so you know, for example, on that, I'm, I'm thinking, I, I'm getting to something on this. There is a new institution that kind of illustrates this called the Climate School, that in which there are courses, specific courses, one of mine was one of them, but cross-listed uh, with like those students can take our courses, specific ones for credit, and I think vice versa. Uh, Kate Orff, who's speaking tonight, you should come to Kate's lecture, uh, is a co-faculty co there. And, and so that's a direct initiative that, you know, like school to school, around an urgent matter of the sort that you're talking about. That's mostly to do with how to address um, the, the crisis that we're all in, the, the climate crisis. And, and so, you know, in that sense, be, because you're at the professional level, this is a bit different than undergraduate where it's more open. Typically, I think you'll have the kind of collaborations, if David Benjamin was here, I think he could talk about relationship with the School of Engineering. Um, they tend to be 
constructed around specific problems and questions uh, that develop, require expertise. And, and so it's shared expertise typically. I'll tell you later about the humanities part, which is what we do in, in the history classes, but I'll let others speak first. And, and, and I would add, and maybe this will touch a little bit on the humanities part. Okay. Um, uh, Professor Mabel Wilson, who I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, currently is serving as the director, chair, chair, thank you, chair of the Triple ADS, which is the African and African American Diasporic Studies Department, um, which is part of the School of it's part of arts and sciences. Part of arts, yeah, part of arts and sciences. Now there is not a let's say a shared curriculum in terms of where she's taking our courses or what have you, but there is of course quite a bit of collaboration between their faculty and our faculty in terms of what things that happen. Obviously similar to the law school, um, Professor Kendall Thomas, who was at the law school for a long time, has participated in a number of programs here. Uh, Jack Halberstam, who is in comparative literature, participates in a number of programs here and is always, not always, but often on reviews um, at the school as well. So there is, let's say, that kind of, of cooperative, if you will. Um, and just to go back to the question about electives or what have you, <clears throat> um, for those of you who have an architecture undergraduate degree, there may be some opportunities to, um, to get advanced standing for some courses. That means that that will open up some space in your six semesters to take an elective in which you could take philosophy, which I took metaphysics when I was uh, in, in my third year, as well as two sculpture classes in, in the School of Design. So there can be opportunities for, you know, for you to get confines of slavery and so on. And other example might be, in, in addition to what Reinhold and Mario mentioned about um, the courses in other schools you might take or programs and having people come here from journalism and other for many of the discussions we have here in this space. Um, I've taught a studio on integrated waste management on Willits Point um, and with Kate Orff, who now leads the urban design program and uh, a professor from the engineering school. So, I mean, there are examples like that um, that are available for a kind of more, you know, hands-on, let's say, in the studio approach where that collaboration would also be an opportunity. Being a graduate program, there's gonna be a lot of different goals that everyone here um, on our side is looking at for outcomes. How can you speak to maybe, other than the curriculum that you guys have already shown us, um, a bias is the wrong word, but maybe the breadth of covering both if our goal is to be uh, further academia or practitioner or research. Um, how are we touching on all those and is there a lean perhaps towards any of the three? Yeah, I think I, I think um, especially uh, what we touch on the professional practice uh, sequence is exactly the, the outcomes, and we are going to take um, everything that GSAP stands for, like the curriculum of uh, equity, climate, um, also practicing uncertainty, and and stress it into what are the modes of practice, what possibilities are after you graduate, and what contribution. Uh, the practice can give to the built environment, thinking about the challenges of uh, climate equity and so on. And I think, um, uh, speaking particularly for this part of the sequence, is very interesting because we also um, organize, for example, Juan Herreros organizes a symposium um, that uh, is a sort of a, um, an understanding of what uh, is happening in the world uh, in terms of alternative modes of practice, an orthodox way of practicing architecture or in challenging territories. Um, I think that is something that uh, respond to uh, part of the question you had. 
one, one more thing? Yeah. Uh, also, yeah, as uh, you probably don't know uh, when you enter the master, well, if you want to go for this research, more research, more academic, more professional, uh, but also as Mario mentioned, uh, especially during the fifth semester and the sixth semester, uh, though you will have a super diverse range of professors, a quarter of them you said coming, like usually from international vi visiting, uh, which I used to be also, um, that will give you many different uh, approaches to the discipline of architecture from many very per uh, perspectives and that you will be able to choose whether that is your like path to follow in the world or not, what, what is your position or what is your role as an architect, but it is going to be yeah, super diverse. No? So, yeah. It's safe to kind of say that we're going to come in, well, obviously it's an accredited program, we have to learn these things. And then as we move into the later semesters, we will be given multiple avenues and be fostered into those areas to explore ourselves as as architects, whatever that might mean. And people get jobs at SOM or at alternative, you know. So there, the, the, yeah. there are many ways to practice architecture, which we acknowledge here. And I think that this education. I mean, I love it when students from here go to very large firms or very small firms. I mean, you, you decide as you kind of, you know, navigate and curate your path through the school, you know, what you want to learn more about, right? And what interests you, and then where you want to go with that for your first step, right? What scale, where, what kind of work, and we help you. Yeah, and I have to say that um, in the past, I mean, uh, um, since I've been teaching the professional practice sequence, I've seen like a lot of how um, the students evolve and what the interests develop. Um, I can witness, as Laurie said, uh, people working for SOM, but at the same time, people that um, are starting to get together to form their own practice since, uh, you know, their presence here at GSAP after the professional practice, people that apply to get grants to form their practice and to understand how they can navigate the world of practice itself, including going to academia. I, I know for sure a number of uh, former students that they form their practice, but they are also teaching and they are trying to evolve the thinking around practice itself. Yeah, I just have a couple of quick things to add, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I first of all wanted to ask Emmeline to jump in because I know well that Emlyn has very specific experience that uh, has proven quite you know, valuable to things that you've done here uh, that might be a little counterintuitive to what you're seeing, uh, the, the um, a, a calm side of, the, you know. And yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, but, but yeah, pass it on. But um, just quickly before that, the, 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 the way to think about this is, is not like a linear, like you're being no. trained for X, Y, Z, and I don't know, maybe you can say more about that. But, but for example, in history courses, we're not even training you in any, th the, the, the history courses that we teach are not about how to be an architect. They're about how to be a human being. And, uh, and so, and about how human beings have attempted to do that in the past <laughs> using something that we recognize as architecture. And, and so there are, there, are, there are other, you know, elements in the curriculum that might take these things up differently. Um, but, but it is very important, I think, to recognize that this is not uh, a school in how not to do something. It's actually, you know, very much to do with what's really happening in the world, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, thanks, Reinhold. And these are really great questions. Um, so, I, I mean, I, as in, in representation, right, I think thinking about it's not the instrumentalization of drawing for practice necessarily, even though you do learn tools, we don't just think about them, we use them, right? But I think, in the, in the sense of, if I think about my own research as a kind of scholar designer, hybrid blurring person in, in this triangle that you've mapped out, right? It's never, never quite falls neatly into one category. And I think that's the beauty of GSAP, right? Um, uh, I, I kind of think uh, about like kind of the most banal tool that you think of in architecture, which is building information modeling, right? But also I, I think about it kind of politically, uh, critically, materially, um, what does it mean? How, how does it mobilize labor? What, what does it mean for kind of future of the practice, you know, when we're talking about um, large-scale practices that occlude smaller practices and so on. So, I mean, it's like complicating the frame, but it, it is also kind of 
bringing, I think bringing questions is a, it's, it's not just a critical thing, but it, or it's not just a design thing. I think it's, it's both and, and that plurality, that, that overlap allows you to create something new and, and ask something differently to maybe a, another school that might shoehorn you down one path. So yeah, it's a kind of multiplicity of things that I think is interesting and, and maybe open-ended, but I'm happy to chat further as well. No, I think that, I think I came in with an assumption of what the program was, and you guys are very much confirming that in a positive note for me. Uh, as someone who's very nonlinear. We're supposed to do the opposite. Yeah, you know. discourage me from being here. So that was that was perfect. Yeah, thank you. But I bet you didn't know that she's like a specialist in BIM, right? You know, a wayward, a wayward. Yeah. 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 Building information yeah. modeling will ask the specialist. Something we we kind of yeah moan sometimes. <laughs> And, and the funny thing is, I think we're not, in representation, it's not like we're teaching you Revit or anything. I think it's about the way, in, like at least for, through my frame, um, thinking about information as it enters the scene of, of, of modeling, of, of drawing, of image making, like that has complicated the stakes of architecture and the, the work that we do, right? And, and I think it's not just thinking about default settings and the, 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 the kind of box in which we become accustomed to tools, right? And it's, it's very much a broader question whether you use one software or not. It's not about that. It's about tools and politics and labor and, and also um, experimental kind of action through them. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't want it to be a like specialist conversation. I think it's very much a pluralistic approach to represent. I don't know why this mic is so echoey, but leave it there, thank you. Hi, um, could you talk about a little bit about what students do in the summers in between uh, years, um, whether that's professional practice or visiting studios? Um, what like what percentage of students actively do something versus like chill out? <laughs> yeah. We are in New York City. Nobody chills out. You know, nobody just chills out. Um, so I think that most people work. Uh, there's a fine line between fun and work. Um, I would say that we, we do have a portfolio review at the end of second year, and um, that is a portfolio that is usually done to recap the first years and also to, we review it in uh, May, and the idea is that we also are thinking about what you're doing that summer. So that's part of thinking, this is, this is the last summer before you graduate from architecture. Uh, what are you curious to do and how can we help you reach that during the summer? So the summer, the summer whether you are, you, because we are in Manhattan, uh, because we're in New York City, you have a very active traveling population. And so whether you're going to be in New York or you're going to be anywhere in the world, we have tentacles. Uh, people that have been here, students, professors. As it was mentioned, we have 18 studios in the last year. Many of those are uh, professors that come from other places and do not practice in New York City. And we also have a lot of people that practice in New York City that is a very complex and technical place to to practice and do things. And so most people work, most people work in things that they are curious about and either decide that's definitely where I'm going or I'm not going in that way. But but the summer is intense, it's work, and we are always looking for people to work with the school and to work with us outside the school. It's a very collaborative um, environment. Yeah, and as a follow-up, um, I guess I wanted to know how the school helps students pl get placed in the summer, or is it kind of a, you know, you do your own re uh, outreach to firms that you're interested in or research you're interested in? Um, well, we have, I would say there are maybe three or so ways. Um, one is that we do have a career office um, the careers office um, uh, primarily supports students who are graduating, but they also, we have a career fair for students who are graduating and for 
um, firms that may be looking for interns for the summer. Um, so that is one way. The second way is through the networks that you develop, particularly with your professors. Um, I can't tell you how many students say, oh, I'm going to be here. Do you know who's looking for summer intern? Can you, uh, can I use you as a reference? Can you write me a letter? Um, and I'm happy, you know, happy to do that. Um, and, uh, and then third is uh, not only through your, through your critics and professors, but also, also through your, your colleagues and people that you've gotten to know in the, in the school, um, knowing what's, you know, what's going on outside of the school. Um, I wanted to add, as well as working during the summer, um, the, the school also offers or has um, about six or so workshops that are offered um, during the summer, and those can be workshops with um, the Global Africa Lab that I co-direct with Mabel Wilson, or it could be the um, Historic Preservation Lab of uh, Professor uh, Jorge Otero Cayos, and those travel, um, and those can um, be from two to four weeks throughout the summer. Um, Jorge's, I think, generally stays in New York, um, but Mark Lasuda's, um, I think they went to Mount Vesuvius and was looking at the environment and climate and um, the history, if you will, of, um, of environmental issues, but relative to, um, you know, to the history of, you know, of, of Southern Italy. Um, and the Global Africa Lab two years ago went, along with Professor Emmanuel Masu, traveled to Dar es Salaam for a couple of weeks. So those are also opportunities that you can apply for and then be accepted for, for summer workshops. I suspect people, just for the sake of transparency, these are tuition-based, right? They, we should be clear that there are things you pay for, there are things you get paid for, and there are things you should get paid for. <laughs> and, you know, because I know you, you know, I mean, you guys are thinking, of, you have to be thinking about the cost of education and um, and the the travel and the summer. There's quite a lot that's built in, but but we should be clear about. Uh, and I, I couldn't give you the details, but we should be clear about well, that. Well, the travel. Yeah. There are at least a couple of opportunities to travel. The sixth semester, yeah. all of the studios. Travel. That's built in. That's built in. You do. You get us. You receive a stipend for that. All of the studios are. I would say sixteen of eighteen are traveling internationally. Um, that's built in. Summer workshops are also built in. Um, so that's not, you know, they're, that's, completely built in. they're completely built in. That's not, that's not tuition. You do have to apply, so it's not you know, automatic. Um, and, uh, and they are limited, so everyone doesn't get to take a summer workshop because there may only be six of those offered. Um, but it, that's how it works. Uh, I, the, what I had in mind about the, the last one you should get paid for is beware the unpaid summer internship. Uh, that's a very important part of the professionalization. We actually teach the history of, of the exploitation of the architect a little bit in the, um, in the class, the history classes. Uh, be, you know, basically, beware the all-nighter, don't do all-nighters, and don't do unpaid inter in internships. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's, and, you know, that's part of the ethics, the professional ethics that we try to cultivate. Um, how do studios touch on the topic of climate, and what are some questions that have challenged students? What are, what are some questions that have challenged students? Hmm. Uh, yeah, like, uh, so we are living in this context of climate change, so we are addressing this idea of, uh, yeah, that there are different crises derived from climate change, and uh, we also problematize the notion of ecology and try to problematize how we are um, uh, conceptualizing the concepts such as nature or coexistence, no? and uh, trying to um, uh, work uh, the notion of ecology, not just from a technical perspective, not just from the low carbon footprint perspective, but trying to decenter human exceptionalism and trying to also work in uh, decolonialism, the patriarchalism, the uh, anti-specism, no? so to try to, yeah, decentralize the figure of the 
white modern um, male uh, uh, human and trying to uh, explore other forms of coexistence, uh, equity, uh, in order to think of desirable futures, no? All at the same time, no? Uh, all facing these crises derived from climate change, no? So how we do that? <laughs> it's, it's like uh, first, uh, first uh, in the first semester, uh, what we do is to uh, try to get a lot of experience on facing the project, like facing the project for the first time, no? So we we tackle this situation in four different super quick exercises that Mario just showed two of them. So first exercise is this body ecology where you uh, put yourself in, in the center and try to, um, in, the, in uh, scale one to one, um, uh, try to establish a relationships, with, a new relationship with your environment. Then we do an exercise of the, um, uh, of the metabolic section where you understand the transcalarity of architecture, you know, that the details where, uh, the, where we are uh, in the architecture that we are living now, it has implications in many other places. Our know, energy, our waste is going to other places, other people are suffering our waste, the energy or the materials are being extracted from other places and so on. Then we have another scale of exercise, the garden, and another scale, the climate. No? So we try to face this in different scales, always um, mediated by the architectural design. So it's not that like we are always, uh, our outcome is always uh, an architectural product that is mediating amongst the context. Um, and that is in the first semester, but that is what we are, but what you are usually doing every semester, no? So trying to work in this context of climate change, mostly in every, I think in every studios you work in this, in these terms, no? So I teach a studio, I've been doing a number of studies on infrastructure and specifically on rising currents. And we're in New York City and we have serious rising currents and so We've, I've often taken a site on the water. Um, we took one in the spring in Brooklyn, which was a really interesting site that I became aware of that uh, Equinor is staging a number of huge wind turbines to put out. We're gonna have a huge wind farm. New York's a great place for wind, but it's complicated. Do we really wanna use our waterfront for that? What does that waterfront become? And we have to be aware as somebody who builds of those inches of water that are here and are coming and are rising. Right now, they're planning a wall down in Battery Park City that's gonna be 10 feet high. I'm on the Public Design Commission. I have to review it. I have two, I have another job that I'm not paid for, but we're reviewing a 10 foot high wall that's going to be along the Hudson River. So it's extremely real, it's coming, but we have to face this as architects. It's a design, it's a design problem. Right, and, and we, so, we have experts on our, on our faculty and in the MRC program. Um, David Benjamin, for example, who's been working on this for a number of years and who is, I would say, can answer any question about climate change and go very, very deep. Um, is teaching a studio this semester that's called Carbon Removal Architecture. So it's coming at it from a different approach. Um, uh, Reinhold mentioned, you know, David also has a collaboration with uh, the School of Engineering that he's been working on a research project um, dealing with uh, dealing with climate change. And then we have, uh, who's a visiting professor, uh, this is his second uh, second year here, is Philippe Rahm uh, from Paris, who is also an expert on climate change. And I would say David and Philippe, you know, approach this very, very scientifically. So. Um, you know, not just sort of anecdotally, but they're deep into the into the calculations and into the into the science of climate change. I, I, sorry, I just, can I just wanted to quickly answer the other question that you asked? I think about the questions that make that are difficult for students, and I think probably this is one that in which we share the difficulty. Um, and to give you an example, uh, I it, so it's the realism that Lori's offering is a part of it, but. I, I teach a class called Climate Technology and Society, which is not really, it's somewhat of a history class, but it, it really tries to kind of identify um, 
the uh, the political and uh, and social dimensions uh, of what we is often seen, including by many of my colleagues, I must say. So there, there are debates basically going on in the field about this as a technical question. So, and the hardest. So I showed you know the Keeling curve. You guys know the Keeling curve. The Keeling curve is 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 just the curve that just keeps going up. It's what you're worried about. We're all worried about. It's the carbon, the CO2 in the atmosphere, right? So I show, I use that, and every week we kind of work, we do a kind of chronology of the Keeling curve and look at what's going on at this nexus. What's he doing? <laughs> I never know what he's doing. <laughs> you know, as it goes up, and and you can feel, I honestly, in the in the in the classroom, you can feel the trepidation, because the one thing nobody has yet figured out is how to change the change in climate change. That's the real issue. The issue, and that's that we're fighting, we're really, it's a race against the clock, and, and it's not just a technical question, and if it was only a technical question, in a sense, it would be, you know, solved. Um, but, you know, why those currents are rising, and why that curve just keeps going up, no matter what, how much we try to, you know, beat it down, we can't flatten that curve. Uh, and that's, that hasn't happened yet, and that's the question I think we, you know, we all share as a, the kind of anxiety around. And it's certainly what, I, what, what students say when I, you put it in these terms, how do you change climate change? Right? That's, it's difficult, but we have to do it. I mean, we have no choice. Um, I'm interested in GIS, and I was wondering if there's any courses that focus on that specifically, or otherwise how students have incorporated that into their work. Yeah, I can take that. Uh, so, um, as you might have seen, the smorgasbord is a new computational, part of the computational glue that wraps and wraps GSAP. Um, that's run by Laura Kurgan and uh, the CDP program. And they have electives in GIS, QGIS, um, that are open to the whole school. So it's kind of an elective-based thing. Um, there, you can uh, bring it into questions of representation. Sure, we, we're not doing a kind of uh, kind of deep GIS um, uh, introduction in uh, the first two, the ADR one and two, but um, you're you know obviously surrounded by um, mapping um, specialists and and people who map critically, who offer many courses. So I would say that it's in the electives. There were like a couple of. Hello, um, so I guess my question is more about the creating aspects of architecture. So when you're designing, how do you know that something's done? Like how do you know that it's really done? Like I understand that there's this sensibility behind it, but how? <laughs> well, we had a big... Okay, um, this is like a slightly more conceptual question, but since GSAP really seems to emphasize the idea that architecture is not a given, I was wondering if any of you guys would be willing to share insights on how your own perspective on architecture has shifted during your tenure teaching here. Um, so how do you know that something is done? Uh, it's not done. You are working on things all the time, whether it's a building, that you work and the group of people that are using the building continue using that building and have changing lives that change, necessitate changing the building as an institution or as a home or as a collective uh, enterprise. Um, how do you know that you arrive to the right moment to let it go and build it, you know, to kind of let it go from the drawing board and it's the same thing. It's it's a, a architecture is a machine of consensus. Uh, the bigger the project, the most people that have to agree. Somebody pays for it. Somebody builds it. Somebody draws it. It's uh, and so I think that um, as practicing architects are become better and better. One of the reasons why architecture is good in your uh, in your older years. It's because you practice a lot, agreement, finding agreement, understanding what is at stake for different parties. And so I, I would say that the training that you'll do here is a preparation to 
be attentive to the opportunities and a facilitator of the kind of flows uh, of information and and to your question you know one is a you, being a, a, a practitioner being an academic being a researcher it's like a braid of uh, of those things um, at least in, in 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 the way I see it um, and your question how has uh, being a practice in architect being a, a, a professor at a school that practice uncertainty changed me it changes it changes us changes has changed me in so many ways um, I can um, you know the work that, that I'm, I'm doing uh, with Lori um, uh, for the inflatable, for example, that has uh, permutated in years. Uh, it, it was first done with an artist um, in 2011, and then in 2021 we we took it together, and it has it's bigger and better and more complex and more perplexing every time we do it. And it's not just because we set up to do a more difficult build. Thing. It's because we are interacting with you guys, and you change the way uh, things are. And, and in housing that I've been teaching for, I don't know, more than 10 years, um, housing has changed a lot too. And, uh, and it felt like you know many years ago, we were talking about the importance of making housing more central to the practice of architecture. And now the entire country is talking about how, and that it's not only an architectural question, it's, it's uh, us as, as people, us as you know, humanists uh, in, in this world, trying to figure it out um, how to make the a home, something as important as that, uh, more plentiful and more accessible to more people. Is that an architectural question? Not, not entirely. Is that, a, is that a environmental question? Very much so in many, many ways. And so all these things are so intertwined and you change um, and we are porous to each other. I have to answer the yeah. other one. She's making me answer the other one. You have to answer it too. Because we used to teach together. Yeah. So believe it or not, I used to, so at, I'm trying to, to, I'm sure others have a lot to say. I've been here, I think, almost the longest, the longest, right? Yeah. Look down the line, uh, 25 plus years, okay? And uh, the I actually have to say that in, at one level, um, I don't think much has changed in the way that I've come to think about the sphere of, of a couple of things, the domain of knowledge, the, the, you know, whether we're talking about my specialty, which is historical, or the more general domain that we share. Um, of course, a lot has changed in those that time, but um, the the uh, the one thing I would I would say that I've become more convinced of is is what I said in the beginning in response to the first question: uh, the need to preserve in an environment that is increasingly is under pressure in two different ways. One, from in terms of the question we were just discussing, from the outside, so to speak, uh, in in terms of the kind of you know, shared emergency that we're really experiencing. The other is is internally a kind of uncertainty, to borrow Mario's language, about the object of study and of you know uh, of of creation. Um, I'm not that uncertain. I you know I I teach facts, so I'm not worried about those facts whether they're true or not. I we have processes for verifying those. Uh, the 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 meaning of those facts in relationship to the world is what keeps changing because the world changes. Um, and so uh, that's reflected in the way curricula change, the way the, the you know, faculty evolves and all kinds of things like that. But, but I, I would say that if anything, um, the con for me at least, the conviction that a professional school and specifically a program like this is in a position to do something about it has has increased. You know, that's maybe the thing that's changed the most. Is like, okay, we can't afford to play games, and and there's something really very serious at stake in the world, and 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 that's the difference maybe between a, a general, more liberal education and a professional one. That's what I was saying in response to your other question, that that there are 
not, not problems to be solved in the instrumental technical sense, but there, there is action uh, that, that, that demanded of, of, of us collectively that we can't afford not to take. And, and that has heightened uh, in, and come into greater focus for reasons that I think are obvious. So. But if you have any questions, please feel free to come down. Okay. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, please do uh, go visit the reviews, um, which are happening on the uh, fourth floor, fifth floor, and on the sixth floor in the Square Lounge. These are the studios for the album, which are Thank you, guys.